Hello everyone, this is Peter Becker, and I'm pleased to team up for the first segment of the program with Rob Vanderbilt, who is the creator of Keras Lots, which is the world's most sophisticated software for plotting boundaries. I am a former ICJ staff lawyer. Our pre-ruling analysis underscores how maritime boundary delimitation is part law and part science, the two disciplines being intertwined. And Rob and I will set the stage and provide a framework for discussion by Abdul and Albert. And we'll do, do so as neutrals, pretending there is no ICJ case. So we are disinterested observers from the outside. And I'll let Rob make an initial disclaimer before we start our discussion. Thank you, Peter. Uh, just make sure that everyone in the audience realizes every effort has been made to ensure the accuracy of the graphics. Nevertheless, these are illustrative, indicative, independent, and preliminary. And it is the request of both of us that any contained figures in the presentation not be used without the permission of either of us. Thank you, Rob. Now, in terms of policy options, let's keep in mind coastal states with overlapping claims to maritime areas have a basic choice between finding a bilateral solution or seeking third party assistance. And the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, to which Somalia and Kenya are parties, calls for negotiation in good faith of what it calls provisional arrangements of a practical nature pending final delimitation of an exclusive economic zone or continental shelf. That is a treaty obligation. Now, examples are the creation of a joint development zone where the disputing states agree to disagree on the boundary and then proceed to joint development of an overlapping claim area. Or international or cross-border unitization where a discovery is made. And these instruments enable the decoupling of questions of joint development from questions of sovereignty and sovereign rights. And the September 2017 ruling in the case between Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire is especially instructive regarding the legal obligations of neighboring coastal states with active offshore oil blocks but lacking an agreed boundary or a provisional arrangement for joint exploration and exploitation of hydrocarbons pending agreement on the common boundary. There's a helpful paper by William Onorato on the, web, on the website of the hub that I can refer you to. Now, disputing parties can also seek to delimit the disputed boundary through negotiation or, or through non-binding mediation or conciliation by a third party. Or the boundary dispute can be submitted to a third party adjudicated <coughs> solution either through ad hoc arbitration or adjudication by a standing tribunal. And that's, of course, what happened here in the case of Somalia and Kenya. We have no agreed maritime boundary, or so the two countries appear to claim. And there is a pending case between these two countries before the World Court or the ICJ. Uh, as a note, self-help through the use of force is prohibited by the UN Charter, uh, and so you uh, can expect not to see naval vessels clashing uh, offshore. A body of maritime delimitation case law or jurisprudence has developed through at least 25 decisions rendered by various international courts and tribunals since 1969. And, and through a technique that Rob and I call maritime boundary reverse engineering and relying on uh, our legal and scientific expertise, we can apply the lessons from the case law to a given dispute, such as the one between Somalia and Kenya, and try to make informed predictions regarding its outcome. And the ICJ is the undisputed front runner, as you can see, with a dozen judgments. Now, ICJ boundary cases, on average, take five years and nine months to conclude. <coughs> and in this case, uh, we are actually marking uh, the 69 month anniversary. Uh, so we are already on the wrong side of the mean uh, in this case. Okay, so how does an international court such as the ICJ arrive at an adjudicated maritime boundary? What can we expect from the ICJ in terms of the, the limitation process? Certainty 
equity and stability are integral parts of this delimitation process. So we can expect to see them play out in this case. And these three elements are reflected in a three-stage methodology developed by the case law. Now, the court can be expected to start by determining what is called the relevant area. And it does so by identifying the geographical context of the delimitation. And that includes relevant coasts formed by projecting coastal frontages that overlap, as well as protrusions and offshore features such as islands. Then the court will establish a provisional line, typically but not always, by drawing an equidistance line between adjacent coasts, as in this case, or a median line between opposite coasts. And the point really is typically not how to draw the line, but where to draw the line from. That is, what is the land terminus point? And we'll get to that in the presentation. Rob will show you the issues with the land terminus point and the equidistance line. At the next second stage, the court will consider whether there are factors calling for the adjustment or shifting of a provisional line in order to achieve an equitable result. And these factors are called relevant circumstances, and the case law favors neutral factors of a geographical nature, such as a significant disparity in coastal length over area-specific factors such as fisheries and oil concessions and oil wells, unless the parties have expressly or tacitly agreed on their location. Now, finally, and at a third stage, the court will verify that the unadjusted or adjusted provisional line does not, as it stands, lead to an inequitable result by reason of any market disproportion between the ratio of the respective coastal length and the ratio between relevant maritime areas of each state by reference to the delimitation line. This is called the disproportionality test, and its application actually could result in an offshore island being given only half effect or no effect at all in the delimitation. Thank you. So what do we have here? Well, we are on the eve of a hearing. And uh, you can see from this uh, snapshot from the International Court of Justice's uh, press release, um, we are less than a month away from the opening of <coughs> oral proceedings in this case. Um, we know that Kenya asked for two postponements and uh, the hearing were, hearings were initially due to open in September, then were postponed to November, and now we're looking at the 8th of June. What do we know about the case from the ICJ website? Uh, there is Somalia's memorial, which is an initial document, but that is from the 13th of July, 2015. Uh, the Kenya position is not yet released. That will be done uh, on the eve of the hearings. And so we are not uh, clear uh, what the Kenyan position is in the case. And also, the final submissions of the parties can only be expected on the final day of the hearings before the ICJ. We do know that the trigger for the case was, uh, according to Somalia, uh, Kenya's granting of commercial oil concessions in the area of overlapping claims. So that's the background. Now over to Rob Vanderbilt. Thank you, Peter. Okay, so this is gonna be a demo. Uh, Law of the Sea is a global marine application that actually impacts 162 countries. Uh, as you see from this global slide, we're focusing in on uh, this portion of the nearshore offshore waters for Somalia, Kenya for today's study. Just to set the stage a little bit, what is the status of maritime boundaries uh, in the world today as of May 2020? There's approximately 501 maritime boundaries in the world. 250 of these are signed and or enforced, which is about 49.9% of the world, which means sadly 50.1% of the world's offshore maritime boundaries remain unresolved and or in dispute. And so today, one out of every two boundaries are disputed as is the case for Somalia and Kenya. Um, just to roll backwards a little bit, um, just so that you understand what's going to be discussed today, um, 14 years ago, uh, we started to assemble a global database for data. There's over 95 terabytes worth of data. We subdivided the planet to cover the entire world 
into eight regions, two for the polar stereographic. We've completed 1,800 projects in 142 countries, but today's focus will be using data only from the African compilation uh, relative to where the desktop study will be covered <coughs> in these waters. Okay, maritime state of play, Central East African Indian Ocean, just to set some facts. The immediate offshore Kenya Somali Indian, uh, Indian waters covers four countries, primarily Somalia, Kenya, but we will need to look a little bit in the neighbor's waters of Tanzania and even the Seychelles. For this law of the sea application, these offshore waters covers just over uh, 1 million square kilometers, but for this specific desktop study for Somalia, Kenya, we're looking at about 385,000 square kilometers geodetic. But again, as mentioned, the primary uh, focus is on the yet to be resolved boundary, Somalia, Kenya. Present status, all four countries in question in our desktop study have ratified and uh, have ascension to UNCLOS, so they're all playing by the same required rules, which is a good thing for doing a desktop study. One thing, desktop studies all begin with uh, coastlines, so here's some quick numbers. Uh, in the study itself, we're only looking at this many nautical miles for Somalia, Kenya. Again, lesser extent for Tanzania, Seychelles. Straight baselines, normal baselines are being used by these various countries, and you'll, I'll cover that in detail. And there's only one maritime boundary in the immediate study area. So there's one treaty, and uh, so one bilateral treaty, and one unresolved dispute, which we obviously know is our primary focus. Just some interesting background. Uh, experts are expecting big oil discoveries in East Africa. This could significantly alter the area. Results of recent studies in the East say it could become one of the world's hottest oil zones. These type of rocks from Sudan oil are going down into Kenya and also offshore Somalia has promising oil reserves. Now, these are just internet references, but what it means is this area is a potential hotspot for hydrocarbon for the offshore. And that's why obviously we need to look at this maritime boundary. Law of the sea by the book. This is how Peter and I address all of these global studies, uh, what we do everywhere on the planet. Desktop study, map and review the relevant coastlines for the states. Desktop study step two, locate the land terminus point. This is the official starting point for all maritime boundaries. Peter mentioned that. Step three, review each coastal state's territorial sea baseline model, that is normal and or straight baselines. Just a note, <coughs> you like normal, they don't really like the straight baselines and we know that from engineer, reverse engineering all these studies. Step four, produce and review the legal limits. We're only looking at the 200 mile for the study. Five is the critical one, maritime boundaries. We're gonna import uh, the, uh, unila uh, the bilateral treaty both countries unilateral. We're going to offer the strict equidistance line, and then we're going to give a bunch of uh, scenarios from past court judgments, and then we'll review the hydrocarbon. So step three. So the relevant East African Indian Ocean Territorial Sea Baseline model, just to set the stage, Somalia claims straight and has legislation for state baselines, but they're not publicly available we did reverse engineer them in the desktop study. They can also legally use normal. Uh, Kenya published straight baselines in June 9th, 2005, and they also have never published but can make full use of normal baselines. Tanzania, Seychelles both use straight baselines as well, but they're in yellow because they're not really factored in that heavily, but we did need to look at it. So law to see by the book. The Regional Neutral Desktop Study, step one, map and review relevant coastlines for all applicable coastal states. Now, this is the key, uh, key setup when we do a desktop study. We need to sort of understand the coastal front. So this is our desktop study. It's a one to seven million scale overview. Here's Somalia, here's Kenya, a bit of Tanzania, and the Seychelles way to the southeast. Showing you the relevant coastlines, there's about 239 miles right in proximity to the border that we need about 472 overall, and about 234 that covers all of Kenya. And there was only about 70, but again, we're barely using it for Tanzania. So the primary focus is the coastal frontages here for the uh, southern portion of Somalia. Even though Somalia is over a thousand uh, nautical miles long, we're only needing to look at the coastal frontier. Also, Kenya is along here. 
Desktop study step two, coastlines. Use and review the best available nautical charts. Now the UN guidelines are very specific in this. They tell everyone this is your starting point. So here is a current UKHO Admiralty chart. 350,000 scale is quite small scale. It was published in 1997. Uh, but you do have to understand what is the data collection and the nearshore, foreshore, offshore surveys. That's the key element here. So it does cover our coastlines, and we can look at this for coastline evaluation. It does give us information for the coastline, and it does allow us to go and look at initial analysis. So let's go and look at these coastlines a little bit closer. So looking at just the border region where we need to do all our analysis for the desktop study for the baseline, here is a detailed zoom in, 100,000 scale of that UK chart. You'll see that there's low water lines. You'll also see the land boundary is on here. We also brought in a second source, Navionics 7 Seas, which is also 100,000 scale, shows about the same detail. But you can see the islands and the coastline are very, very smooth and generic. And that's because these were mapped 50, 70 years ago. So they're just hand-drawn renditions, sadly, on the chart. So uh, you, you do have to consider that while we're doing the desktop study. Relevant uh, coastlines. Now, this is basically how we're depicting this. And you're seeing from the border, from the land terminus point, we're using about 234 miles for here and about the same, just a little bit more, 239. After that, none of these features and offshore features factor in for doing uh, the mathematics behind how you generate a boundary. So the next step here, maritime boundary dispute, just so that we identify the overall region, this is what we in our neutral desktop study will refer to as the relevant offshore area. So we're gonna look at anything and everything within this shaded red polygon. So this is where we're gonna do all of our analysis. And I can tell you there's been over a gigabyte worth of data that we assembled and we analyzed. Step two in the desktop study, uh, locate the land terminus point. Now this is gonna be a, a huge effort that we need to do. Some countries have spent up to a year just spending time to locate this land terminus point. Okay, analyzing our data set. Again, here's our desktop study. We already know that obviously there's a frontier for Kenya, Tanzania, but we're not gonna look at that that much. And I'll explain to you why as we analyze the boundary. So here's the critical focus area. The land terminus point needs to be located for Somalia, Kenya, in order to generate a maritime boundary. So how do we do this? We're gonna go through a bunch of steps. This is using some topography data. This is a wonderful land-based 3D elevation model. Again, homing in here on the coastal area. So we're coming from land, but the land terminus point is where land terminates into the sea. So this is somewhere in here is the probable area that we need to locate this land terminus point. But we need to have a whole bunch of different data sources to try and identify this information and to see how this comes together. We normally go back through history. Here's a wonderful old US defense map that actually shows the land boundary. And again, even in here, it shows the approximate general location with some features coastal. But this is old. This is from 1976. Again, already seen this nautical chart. Again, we know there's some small islands near shore here. We know there's a land boundary. But more importantly, if you bring in some old data, this is a, a Kenyan Gazette, officially from 1973. They talk about the pillar number 29 being the terminal pillar of Kenya, Somalia. They even give an, a very crude latitude and longitude. Keep in mind that's old, old mapping. So let's bring this to present day. Here's a wonderful one meter Apple map image. These, the Uatsu Damascio, I'm going to pronounce that name always wrong, but these five islands offshore are critical. You'll see that there's a boundary down here that is uh, the four meters that is described in this CIA document uh, that we made use of. It talks all about describing Dick's Head, and it also talks about where the coast shall be terminated down here. So this is Kenya, Somalia, location boundary pillar 29, as we have researched it. And again, you can see on this image, this is Somalia and this is Kenya. So this is the land border. Okay, 
And moving on, moving on to the next step, we need to desktop study three, review each coastal state's territorial sea baseline model. Now, straight baselines and normal, we're gonna begin looking at straight, but I do have to stress that the courts really do prefer normal baselines. This red line depicted here, this shows Kenya's published on July 22nd, 2005, uh, their straight baseline. Here on uh, June 30th, 2014, and Peter and I had to reverse engineer it because they didn't actually publish the individual points. They gave us the 200 mile. So we had to reverse engineer it, but that uh, represents Somalia's uh, straight baseline. Now, using present day imagery, we always, as we always do, we evaluate everybody's base points. We've done this for studies for, uh, I was involved with, uh, over 100 countries doing this worldwide for, uh, for various government agencies. And what this is, this is no fault of any coastal state, but these show the Kenyan. Kenya has 10 published straight base points from 05. And you have to understand, Law of the Sea is all about precision mapping. That's where their base point is, and you can see there's land actually to the east of it. Here it's going over land. Here an island was missed, and here an island could be utilized so we actually saw mismatches of up to 500 meters. So that is just some uh, disparity that could be used for additional work. So what do we do? Well, this is something new that we have, uh, we have uh, de developed. It is using satellite imagery for preliminary shallow water mapping application. And in this case, neither Somalia nor Kenya have published normal baselines. So again, from all these diagrams and from this image here at 25,000 scale, you'll see the land terminus, uh, the boundary pillar is down in here. And using normal baselines and using these figures, we have interpreted using this present day satellite image from 10 months ago, we have mapped the uh, normal baseline. So that's the low water line. So there actually is the first time we're looking at the land terminus point. And that's the same procedure that was used in the Ghana uh, Cote d'Ivoire case, whereby the, the tribunal moved the point. The other thing to take note of is these thousands of offshore features, low tide elevations for islands, islets, drying reefs and rocks. All of this is 100% eligible to be utilized by both Somalia and Kenya when producing maritime boundaries. And you'll see they're offshore. Now keep in mind, this is preliminary. This is not 100% survey quality. You still need to blanket map these frontiers <coughs> with proper surveys. So that is a warning flag, but this is how we do this in a desktop study. Okay, utilizing those baselines that we've analyzed. Step four, produce and review the legal limits. We're only gonna do the 200 mile for the desktop study area. So again, looking at our desktop study area, from here, from all those baselines, Somalia will produce 200 miles for their EEZ. Kenya, for all the baselines, 200 miles. K Tanzania, 200, and from the Seychelles. So this red line is defining our 200 mile EEZ. So there we have it. We now have our 200 mile. And the focus is gonna be what is EEZ waters and eventually what is the ECS waters. Moving on, step five, this is the heavy handed part, maritime boundaries. We will be importing existing bilateral treaty agreements, type one, these are published. Type two, unilateral, these are the suggested boundaries by both Kenya and uh, Somalia. So these are hypothetical, but they're unilateral. They're one, they're type two. Number three, strict equidistance, where we will give neutral computed lines in step four. We're gonna give a couple of considerations from various past court cases. So we're gonna in all cover five lines, but there could actually be about 15 lines that we do, but time permitting, we're gonna pick the main ones that we're gonna look at. Again, here is our desktop study. Here we're first looking at type one, treaty. We have in here the historical treaty for the territorial sea between Kenya, Tanzania, July 9th, 1976, that covers the territorial sea. We have April 2nd, 2009, they negotiated the EEZ maritime boundary and went on and did the ECS boundary. The focal point for today's study primarily, of course, is the unresolved boundary here. 
Here is again that CIA US document from 1973, which basically is an interpretation of the treaty July 15, 1924, with modified exchange of notes that are critical that we found of 22nd November 1933. But that represented the UK, Kenya now versus Italy, Somalia now. The takeaway points are the southern terminal point should be 15 many meters inland from the watermark, known as Dar al Salaam. It also talks about the southernmost of the group of five islets. The, the, so Damascus is going to have to be looked at. And so here's the critical thing. In a southeasterly direction, to the limit of the territorial waters in a straight line at right angles, general trend of the coastline at Dar al Salaam, leaving the islets on, in Italian territory. Now, this was really interesting for Peter and I when we stumbled on this. And again, we try and approach this just purely from a neutral's point of view, having done thousands of these studies. So let's try and reverse engineer that. Here are the five islands. You can see them offshore. Here again is the land area, but critically that diagram, that document from 1933 states, taking the southern of the five, a perpendicular line back to the coastline where the land boundary will meet at pillar 29, and then it could move to the low water line. But it actually goes one step farther for both of us. This was extremely interesting. It talks about taking the perpendicular line right at Dar al Salaam, which we did. It's about 35 degrees. Running a perpendicular line straight out. So this straight perpendicular line, it's about 125 degrees to the limit of the territorial waters. Now, territorial waters for Somalia and Kenya both would be 12 nautical miles. Of course, we do not know if it's, uh, it is uncertain how the ICJ will interpret these 1924 treaty. Pete, I believe you have a few words at this moment. Yes, so from the international lawyer, it will be interesting to see how the ICJ will interpret the Italy-Great Britain Treaty of 1924 and the exchange of notes of 1933 that Somalia and Kenya inherited from the colonial powers. Now, Somalia and Kenya may be in agreement that the treaty did not delimit any maritime boundary, but the ICJ can be expected to do its own analysis and interpret the treaty according to the established rules of treaty interpretation codified in the 1969 Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which is binding customary international law for Somalia and Kenya. And the starting point for interpretation is the ordinary meaning to be given to the terms of the treaty in their context and in the light of the treaty's object and purpose. A special meaning is given to a term if it is established that the parties so intended. It is not clear that such evidence exists here. The words, quote, to the limit of territorial waters, end quote, must be given effect, it seems to us. Rob? Thank you, Peter. Okay, so based on that, we're calling that a historical treaty question mark. And here is going to be some boundary analysis now. So again, set the stage, 1.1 1 .1, to 1.5 million scale. Here's the relevant 200 mile. This little first segment is what I just displayed. And again, we're just calling that the historical treaty line possible. Again, this has got a question mark onto it. The next line, this is the unilateral line claimed by Kenya, June 2005, with publication of documentation, and it follows a parallel of latitude. The counter line, so that's a unilateral line here, in, is the Somalia line, July 2014, which runs as a uh, line down in here. But what this is critically giving us is the overlapping claims area, also referred to as the OCA. It's about 50,728 square kilometers by our calculation based on all the analysis that we have done to date. Moving on now, maritime boundaries, type three and type four. Okay, type three and type four. These are computed, so this is in the desktop study. And again, we're gonna fix all our boundary lines onto the end of that potential historical treaty. I've already mentioned both Kenya, Somalia straight baselines. When we draw it out, you can do strict equidistance line. It gives a very lopsided 98.5% of the OCA to Somalia and one and a half to Kenya with that line. But again, some of the straight baselines are somewhat questionable for Kenya. 
The opposite would use the normal baselines. And again, I warn you, these are from our 40 SSM mapping, but it ends up giving an 86.2 to 13.8, where you see the line is migrating up towards the middle. Here's a complete different one, but we did want to consider it because marine protected areas, which Kenya does have historically here in the Kiungu Marine Reserve, and or considering fisheries, there is a past court case where Jan Mayen, Denmark, Norway in 93 used that to give a split of the waters 50-50. So we draw that as a possible line. A complete different one that I still thought was useful was a combination line here used by the courts in January 2014, Peru, Chile, whereby they give consideration of one country's parallel line and the other's strict equidistance. And then we consider the final one, which is really gaining traction in the last couple of years, which is the onslaught of the uh, extended continental shelf. Here's Kenya's claim, about 93,300 square kilometers, large 6 of May 2009. Here directly on top of it is part of it in our desktop study showing Somalia's July 2014 claim. It's only about 127,000 square kilometers, the area in yellow, but their entire is almost 900,000 square kilometers, which is 10 times the full claim of Kenya. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about equity and fairness. But the OCA or overlap is about 76,353. So we did some splitting of some math. There's four past recent court cases that all made considerations of shifting the line in the name of equity because of the extended continental shelf. And that would give it a 60-40 in the ECS and a 50-50 in the EEZ. But to wrap things up, it does make both of us ask the question, are these overlapping areas, the EEZ and the ECS, a candidate for joint development zone, joint development area, JDA? This was a solution for similar disputes now in some 22 areas around the world. So I do throw it out there. Now, why is this all important? Last step, hydrocarbon. I've already mentioned that area is potentially rich. We're going to review regional existing offshore seabed activity only the hydrocarbon industry. These are blocks that are open, defined by, defined by the countries, blocks that are issued to oil companies, current bid rounds that are active, and future bid rounds that are pending. All of this needs to be considered when we're looking at this offshore frontier area. And keeping in mind, all these blocks I'm going to mention to you are coming from a third-party product called Drilling Info. Again, just a disclaimer, these are as is, these are shown, but they are from April 2020. The orange area is the OCA ECS and the yellow area uh, uh, EEZ, and this is the ECS. These, orange, uh, these red blocks, Kenya has issued them, but they're all open. So they're, they're out there, but they're not held by IOCs. These three green ones and these three green ones in the OCA are issued to international oil corporations who hold the right to explore. There is also a future bid round that's on the books uh, about one year from now, July 2021, and you'll see there's several blocks that encroach into the overlapping claims area. Somalia has all these open blocks at the border region, and interestingly enough, they even go beyond uh, the OCA. There's two green blocks issued as per drilling info, but it's outside of the overlapping claims area. But interestingly enough, there is, as per drilling info, there is current bid round with two blocks that lie in near proximity to the OCA. And what this finally all summarizes is present day offshore hydrocarbon blocks impacted by the overlapping claims area dispute. Kenya has eight and Somalia has 18 in this figure. Pete. Thank you, Rob. So switching it to uh, the private sector and uh, the legal perspective uh, quickly, uh, the question um, can, uh, can be raised, uh, does the private sector, uh, does the petroleum industry have a role to play uh, in boundary disputes between coastal states? After all, concessionaires, or licensees are directly affected by a maritime boundary dispute, as, as Rob just showed. 
And as a rule, this is the purview of sovereign states. Oil companies cannot be formal parties to boundary cases. So you will not see an oil company appearing on the side of other party before the International Court of Justice in The Hague. But foreign companies can and should work with the disputing states. And the goal here is to be a help, not a hindrance. And help means providing geological or other data to both states, if requested, or identifying experts, such as Rob Vanderpol, uh, provided this is done in a neutral way. Foreign concessionaires should take care not to take sides with one state over another and refrain from aggressive lobbying. And some caution and restraint are called for. Rob? Okay, thanks again, Peter. Uh, that actually concludes the initial portion uh, of today's webinar. That is all from Peter and myself. Uh, we'd like to thank you for uh, allowing to uh, present this. And at this moment, I will hand the floor back to Madam uh, Chairperson, and uh, she can take over. All right. Well, um, thank you so much. Robert and Peter for that very, very riveting presentation. I would like then to get a few comments from Abdul Abdurrahman and Uma. I'll start off with uh, Abdul. Maybe in five minutes, can you give us of um, Somalia's approach and stance in the dispute? Well, um, you know, as a background, uh, I'd like to point out that Somalia is emerging from 30 years a civil war that had gone on for 30 years since 1990. And uh, with regard to the current dispute, uh, the general feeling within the Somali government, uh, which I believe informed its own uh, uh, decision making during the uh, dispute uh, in front of the International Court of Justice and within the Somali population, is, is that while Somalia was involved in all of these issues, uh, and conflict uh, during the civil war that uh, Somali territory. Now, I want to make very clear that uh, when I say Somali territory, that this uh, territory is still subject to contested claims from both sides. But from the Somali point of view, that they believe that they have uh, sovereignty and exclusive jurisdiction in this area, and that Kenya um, had uh, issued concessions in this area to foreign uh, oil companies that have uh, started uh, operations. So within that background, uh, there were some negotiations that took place to settle this uh, contested claims between Somalia and Kenya. Uh, these uh, discussions went on in 2014, I believe uh, from uh, February to, to August. And during those uh, discussions, um, the two parties not only couldn't agree on a settlement, but they couldn't even agree on what type of uh, method should be used to delimit the uh, joint maritime boundary. And uh, looking at the timeline that, uh, that Somalia had set out in its memorial that was submitted to the International Court of Justice, it appears to me that Somalia from the outset was prepared for two outcomes. One outcome was to settle the uh, dispute through bilateral uh, negotiations and agreement with uh, their Kenyan counterparts. But at the same time, it appears from, um, to me, uh, from the, the timeline in the memorial that Somalia was also prepared for the eventuality of a failure in uh, these talks. And uh, I do base that on the fact that uh, within the timeline of uh, the negotiations between Somalia and Kenya, uh, the Somali uh, government submitted the case to the ICJ within days of uh, the final contact made by the Somali Minister of Foreign Affairs to his Kenyan counterpart uh, on, I believe, uh, uh, August the 26th. And that contact referenced uh, meetings that had been scheduled prior for the 25th and the 26th in Mogadishu to continue negotiations. Um, and Kenya did not turn up for those meetings. And now this is the position of the Somali government. 
And uh, at that point, the Somali government reached that any further negotiations on this issue were fruitless. And Somalia's position has been that in the spirit of the uh, United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, that Somalia has fulfilled its obligation to uh, enter into good faith bilateral negotiations to settle the boundary dispute. And that since that have failed, that now they are going, uh, now they have submitted the claim to the International Court of Justice to settle the matter. And uh, Somalia has requested that uh, the method that should be used should be the equidistance method. Okay, thank you very much, Abdul. And uh, Sa'al Batmuma, let's hear from you regarding as approach and stance in the dispute. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Warimu. I think what uh, is quite uh, clear is that, you know, Kenya was obviously uh, taken by surprise when uh, Somalia filed these proceedings at the ICJ. Uh, it would appear, of course, that uh, Somalia, on the other hand, uh, you know, had been uh, preparing for these kinds of proceedings for quite a while. Uh, you know, Kenya had assumed that, uh, you know, first of all, uh, there was a framework uh, for reaching a negotiated settlement. Uh, and secondly, that, uh, you know, negotiations were in fact going to take place, uh, you know, after the delineation of the outer uh, continental shelf uh, by, you know, that, you know, so they, they were not at all prepared and were quite surprised. Now, uh, it is also the case that, uh, you know, I think uh, given the history of Somalia that, that uh, Abdul has indicated where for a very long period of time, Somalia has uh, had internal conflict and internal instability with considerable impact uh, on Kenya's own stability uh, in terms of uh, you know, security uh, in issues, in terms of the fact that Kenya has hosted the, the, you know, in the past the Somali interim government in terms of the fact that Kenya hosts a large number of uh, you know, Somali nationals who are displaced. Uh, the reaction of the Kenya government, I think, and of the people of Kenya uh, you know, was was one of not just surprise, but uh, you know, a thought that somehow, uh, you know, this this was a slap in the face. So that I think uh, characterizes, uh, you know, the stance that, uh, you know, and the reaction that Kenyans had to these uh, proceedings. Nevertheless, I think what Kenya did uh, in the first instance was to object to the jurisdiction of the ICJ on the basis of a memorandum of understanding that had earlier uh, been agreed between Somalia and Kenya, which had made reference to the fact that there would be a negotiated approach to delimiting uh, the boundaries, uh, the maritime boundaries between the two countries. But I think it is common knowledge now that that objection to jurisdiction failed and the uh, International Court of Justice came to the conclusion that that particular memorandum of understanding did not in fact provide for uh, an alternative approach to uh, reaching a, a, an agreement on the negotiated boundaries, on, on the disputed boundaries. Uh, in the end, I think what uh, Kenya argues is that, uh, you know, the uh, proper position uh, which uh, should be adopted is to uh, delimit these particular boundaries uh, using the parallel line. Uh, and the, the reasons that Kenya advances are essentially that, uh, on the one hand, they, you know, historically for a long period of time, uh, dating back at least to 1979, Kenya has exercised jurisdiction over this particular uh, contested area. And there has not been any uh, protest, any challenge, uh, from Somalia to Kenya's exercise of jurisdiction over that area. Uh, the first challenge comes, uh, you know, just at about the time uh, before these proceedings are uh, filed. So I think Kenya argues that, in fact, if you look at that, then you can see uh, that, you know, there is a legitimate claim by Kenya. But secondly, they say there is regional practice, uh, which uh, has been 
adopted between Kenya and Tanzania, between Kenya and Mozambique, between Tanzania and Mozambique, uh, for that kind of um, you know parallel line. And these uh, are some issues, obviously, which I'm sure will be uh, put before the court uh, when uh, Kenya finally files its response. Uh, but basically, that I think has been uh, Kenya's stance uh, with with regard to this particular issue. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Muma, for those um, comments. I think I'll I'll dive to you, Abdul Abdurrahman. We've heard from Professor Muma. We've also had the presentation by um, Robert regarding the various options that can arise in this matter. What the lessons from Somalia's perspective, of course, not speaking on behalf of Somalia, speaking in terms of what Somalia is doing presently and the new development seen um, on Somalia's side. Take us a little bit through that. You know, as I previously indicated, you know, Somalia during the 30-year uh, civil war was not active in the offshore. However, uh, since 2013, uh, the Somali, uh, the representatives of the Somali government in the international field have been extremely active in engaging with the international oil companies uh, with regard to uh, prospect uh, blocks offshore Somalia. Currently, I believe there are uh, a little over 200 blocks that have been identified uh, as available. Um, uh, I mean, that have been delineated by the Somali government. Uh, however, the uh, and also uh, last year, uh, I believe it was February uh, 2019, Somalia held uh, a road show in London uh, to showcase uh, the developing petroleum law at the time and also the blocks that might be on offer. I'd like to make it very clear that uh, during these presentations, uh, Somalia did not uh, indicate in any way that it was uh, setting up uh, either for auction or for bidding or even for availability any blocks within the contested area. Uh, however, just north of that contested area, there are several uh, blocks that have been identified as extremely prospective and containing possibly large uh, quantities of um, hydrocarbons. Uh, with regard to that, Somalia has been very active in uh, putting together a new petroleum law to take over from uh, the last petroleum law that was passed in 2008. Uh, the new petroleum law that was uh, signed into uh, service by the Somali president uh, in, I believe, February 2020, a few months ago, um, essentially is very similar to the 2008 petroleum law. And um, that petroleum law creates a Somali national oil company, which would be the focus of authority to uh, sign international oil agreements. Um, within Somalia, uh, there is... Uh, you know, Somalia has adopted a federal system. And I'd like to point out that within the uh, federal system, uh, the, uh, there are several member states. And to a large extent, the member states are, uh, I would say, as powerful as a central government with regard to actual uh, authority on the ground. And uh, there have been very spirited negotiations back and forth between the member states and the Somali government. They have come up with a revenue sharing plan uh, that was attached uh, as an exhibit to the, or I would say embedded into the new Somali petroleum law uh, to satisfy the member states. But the power to make uh, decisions, the power to make, uh, to negotiate and sign international agreements now seems to have been uh, given to the federal government. Clearly, this uh, simplifies uh, things for the prospective international oil companies because then they have uh, one um, entity to deal with with regard to Somalia. Um, Somalia is still apparently working on uh, its tax laws to, uh, so that they can ensure maximum revenues from any oil uh, deals. Nothing to, to my knowledge, uh, there has not been a fiscal regime that addresses uh, hydrocarbons or possible revenues or even 
um, the uh, you know for example if one of the oil companies wishes to farm out any of its uh, interests in a block i don't believe there has been any uh, tax uh, code to make sure to ensure that that uh, process is taxed and uh, that uh, whatever taxable event takes place in any of these um, you know negotiations that the Somali government is able to uh, tax the event and ensure that they get uh, revenues. Um, but uh, I would like to say that Somalia has been remarkably quick, remarkably aggressive uh, in the international arena. Um, just this week, uh, Somalia announced a new bid round. Uh, they have offered seven blocks. Uh, none of these blocks are within the contested area. Uh, I believe there is one block uh, on, that's adjacent to the uh, Jubaland member state, uh, block 204, that's available, that Somalia has made available for bidding. Um, so uh, they are moving on. I'd like to touch upon one quick thing also, though. Uh, within the contested area, as previously stated, uh, Kenya has uh, issued some concessions to some companies. And uh, in Somalia's memorial that they submitted to uh, the uh, international court, it is, it, part of it is that it is looking for a ruling that would allow it to declare that any action that Kenya has taken uh, has been uh, you know, a violation of Somalia's sovereignty and jurisdiction. I believe that a particular um, you know, request to the international court is basically a building block for how Somalia will deal with the concession holders in the area. And, and I don't believe that Somalia will respect or uh, continue to um, continue the concession rights of any of those blocks should the International Court of Justice rule in its favor. All right. Um, thank you very, very much, Abdul, for your thoughts on Somalia's um, stance and certainly the lessons from Somalia's perspective. I will double back to you, Professor Albert Numa. Are there any um, additional lessons that you would want to share with us from the Kenyan perspective that arise from this dispute? Yes, I, I think, you know, Kenya basically uh, indicated at the start of this uh, you know, uh, dispute that it remains committed to a negotiated settlement. And uh, I think that uh, you know, when you look at uh, the nature of third party uh, dispute resolution, uh, then you, you can see that there are in fact uh, quite a number of uh, pitfalls associated with the third party uh, binding dispute resolution. It is true, I think, that from the point of view of uh, you know, the oil and gas uh, sector and those who are interested in exploration activities, that they would like uh, clarity and certainty uh, in regard to the, respective, uh, con the country's respective jurisdictions over this uh, contested area. And uh, therefore, uh, they would probably view uh, a decision from the International Court of Justice as helping in the process of clarifying who has jurisdiction and giving them some security over the investments that they are making there. And that, that is, a, you know, a, 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 an understandable, uh, you know, perspective from the point of view of investors. But then uh, third party dispute resolution, such as the decision of the ICJ, has uh, certain serious shortcomings. One is, of course, the fact that, uh, you, know, um, you know, whereas in the short term it might give countries, uh, whoever, whoever, it, it's a winner takes it all, uh, you know, outcome. That one country will win and another one will lose. Uh, the winner will have a psychological boost, but this, uh, and the, the, the loser obviously, uh, will we'll be quite unhappy about the outcome. But even for the winner, these kinds of psychological boost is, is really short term because in, in the end, what one uh, is looking for is uh, to have a framework in the area that would facilitate and incentivize uh, you know, uh, investments in the oil and gas sector 
And that framework will not come when you have regional tension, when you have bilateral tension. And these tensions are likely to be exacerbated by a third party dispute resolution approach, which leads to you know, a winner takes it all outcome. And so I think myself that uh, what one should begin to think about, even as we approach the actual hearing uh, at the ICJ, is a framework for cooperation beyond the decision of the ICJ. Uh, and I would argue that because uh, if you look at this particular region, if you look at the country's uh, concern, I mean, there is a great deal of insecurity, instability. The area is prone to a lot of, uh, you know, uh, terrorist attacks, the sea itself is subject to incidents of piracy. That's not an environment that will encourage any investment uh, that, that, that can be sustained. And so even though one gets a decision that says the jurisdiction falls within country A or country B, what is assumed to be the consequent benefits in terms of you know, investment in the oil and gas sector rising out of that kind of decision, in my view, will not be forthcoming unless there is a framework for cooperation which allows the area to move in the direction of stability. And that can, can only come if people begin to look beyond the ICJ decision so that they begin to establish a framework for cooperation of that kind. And that for me is the, the, the message that I think we should take away from this, uh, you know, this particular session. Thank you. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much to the panel. Uh, and to both uh, Abdul and Albert, Professor Albert Umay and Mr. Abdul Abdurrahman for their comments on what, what we can see and the lessons that we can learn from each country's perspective. Now, I'd like us to get into the Q&A session and I'm sure all of you have had, um, we've had several questions uh, more than 12 questions in the group chat. Thank you very much. Some have been answered by the panelists. Um, I can see a lot of activity with um, Professor Becker on answering the question. Now, I'd like us to, if you, if you ask a question on the chat, it's most likely being answered. There is a question that was asked, just give me one minute, on what would be the best option on resolving um, the dispute. Now, not being speculative, but I think we can have maybe some um, additional remarks from you, Abdul, on, on where you perhaps see um, Somalia getting in in terms of a win-win situation before we get into the Q&A. Somalia has taken the position that they have fulfilled their obligation to negotiate in good faith with Kenya and that uh, they, uh, following those negotiations, which in, their, in Somalia's memorial was termed as fruitless, uh, Somalia has decided that its only option is to take this case to the ICJ. Uh, Somalia is extremely confident, it looks like, that, uh, that the ICJ will rule in its, uh, you know, um, in its favor. Uh, whether that would happen or not, uh, clearly, uh, is still speculative because, as was pointed out by uh, Professor Pecker, uh, that the ICJ has its own ways of looking at uh, legacy uh, colonial uh, agreements and, and boundaries delineated in the past on the land which may extend to the maritime uh, uh, sector as well. Uh, so we don't really know exactly what the court is going to do. Uh, but Somalia is uh, very confident, so, uh, you know, that the equidistance line, uh, which uh, is, has been much favored in the past, would be the method that would be used in delimiting the boundary, the maritime boundary. Um, so at this right. point, I don't believe that Somalia uh, is open to any more negotiations. Now, with regard to... Uh, the whether the case going to the ICJ would uh, cause uh, you know some problems within the Horn of Africa uh, area is open to question. Uh, what we do know is that 
uh, there have been some low level uh, issues between Somalia and Kenya, um, but nothing very serious that would impede uh, the case going forward at this time. All right. Um, thank you. I will also ask for additional comments from um, Professor Albert Muma, especially with regard to the, um, the Kenya's lessons in some of the negotiations and disputes that it has had with um, other countries. Um, you mentioned Kenya, Tanzania. Whilst uh, Professor Muma is answering that question, I have, by public demand, been requested to allow for participant questions audibly to have about two or three participants ask questions. If you have a very pressing problem, which you commit to ask in one minute flat, please um, use the raise your hand icon uh, on your chat um, icon so that we can see who has raised their hand and they can be unmuted to ask the question. Um, Professor Muma, over to you. Yeah, th thank you, thank you, Arimo. The, I think basically the, uh, you know, uh, my own view, and I think as I indicated at the start, uh, I, I do not believe Kenya had seriously uh, put an effort into negotiating this issue at the start. I, I believe Kenya was rather surprised by the fact that it was presented to the I, ICJ. In terms of uh, whether or not in the future a, a negotiated settlement might, you know, some sort of a negotiation to find a framework for cooperation might still be the way to go. I think one of the points I would like to highlight is that in the claim presented by Somalia before the ICJ, they are also looking for reparations. They're basically saying that, uh, you know, regional, their sovereignty over sovereignty has been violated and uh, they would like to be compensated and, uh, you know, just assume for a minute so that uh, indeed that was to be granted then there'll be a long process of, of pressing for that compensation and the associated friction that would arise uh, in that process. But also, if one looks at the, the claim by Somalia, uh, particularly if you, you stretch that uh, equidistant line uh, further down, it actually ends up overlapping with Tanzania, which then means that Kenya would be facing the prospect of being sea locked between Somalia and Tanzania. That is not a prospect that uh, any country can view without uh, considerable alarm. Wow. Therefore, I, I personally think that uh, notwithstanding the fact that the ICJ hearing is approaching, the looking ahead, uh, taking the long-term view, I think sustainability of uh, cooperation in the area requires finding a collaborative framework. Now, in a collaborative framework, uh, you know, as they say with negotiations, one must be willing to compromise. Uh, if you are not willing to compromise, there is no point negotiating. And therefore, the timing of the negotiations is important because, you know, at the time when I think, as uh, Abdul says, Somalia is quite confident that they will come away with a win, then they are not likely to be open to any other uh, approaches to discuss. And so, you know, the timing, you know, probably has to take that factor into account. Uh, negotiations never end, and I personally do not think that the ICJ decision should be seen as the end of the game. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Muma. I will now call on um, Professor Peter Becker, there have been quite interesting discussions on the group chat, and thank you for answering most of the questions. There is one question that I find um, quite interesting for you to address from Njoki M, and it says, while IOC's international oil companies would ideally be expected to not be parties to the ongoing dispute between Somalia and Kenya, this assumption has over time been established to be flawed, they are not bystanders. Um, can you please comment on that? Yes, thank you, Arimu. Um, you know, we all that know that the uh, 
the oil and gas industry and uh, concessionaires of uh, disputing parties are all directly affected by a maritime boundary dispute. They want certainty. Uh, their investments are um, very large and risky. So when there is uncertainty as to who has title, uh, has so the sovereign rights to uh, oil blocks offshore, obviously that's a situation that is not ideal and it could uh, flare up. Uh, we have seen that, especially when the international relations between two countries are, um, are under stress, uh, are less than ideal. And uh, we have seen in other cases that uh, the oil and gas industry can be directly affected by that. Um, even uh, with, with states um, bringing in their naval vessels to shoot at survey um, or uh, exploratory drilling vessels. So I think the um, oil and, and gas industry is not a bystander in the sense that um, they will just wait and see what happens in this case. They can be expected to engage actively uh, with the state that issued the concessions. But as I mentioned, they have no formal role you will not see them appear before the ICJ on the side of Somalia or Kenya. But they have to be very careful, as I mentioned. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Becker. I'll now turn to you, Robert. Now, Professor Muma, in his commentary, brought in the interesting aspect of the fact that uh, if the court was to decide using the distant line principle, Kenya might find that the boundary would extend from Somalia to Tanzania, and Kenya might find itself sealed. Again, um, not to speculate, but have you in the past, and I've, I know you've done a lot of mapping and surveys, encountered situations where um, countries have been sealed or potentially sealed because of the extension of maritime boundaries. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Waimu. Um, when Peter and I looked at this circumstance, this does have some similarities to uh, a huge similar uh, dispute that was Bangladesh versus Myanmar, Burma, and Bangladesh versus India, because in their circumstance, the same thing was potentially happening with the first that went to the court. The boundary was actually uh, seen to be cutting off the access, as uh, as Albert mentioned. So um, there, there is some considerations that could be made for that. Uh, we do know that there is a treaty between Kenya and Tanzania, so this line would actually uh, bring Somalia potentially into conflict with Tanzania. So all these things should be considered. So, um, but when we did the analysis, that was, uh, that was one of our observations. So uh, the, the Kenya may look to what was decided on those various court cases for Bangladesh. Uh, that, that may also give some insight on how to handle this case. Thank you. All right. And um, I think I'll double back to you, um, Professor Becker. Uh, as a follow-up to what uh, Robert has discussed with regard to um, Bangladesh v. India and Bangladesh v. Myanmar and uh, the potential that Somalia might find itself in conflict with Tanzania with regard to Tanzania's um, agreement with Kenya, have you faced, again, not being speculative, but have you faced such a situation where you have a third-party country then being embroiled in a dispute because of a, of a present dispute, whether in an international court or in a tribunal. So let me first point out, thank you, Wairimu, um, that this case is a bilateral case and it has no consequence for any of the neighbors. It's uh, going to be a ruling. If we will have a ruling from the ICJ, that is final and binding only for Somalia and Kenya. Now, as to uh, the regional setting, uh, and there's a reason why we described it, um, there, there have been rulings that said, well, you need to take into account uh, regional um, boundary arrangements. For instance, in the uh, case between Guinea and Guinea-Bissau, another African case, 
the, um, the court said a delimitation designed to obtain an equitable result cannot ignore the other delimitations already made or still to be made in the region. And then the, uh, the tribunal in that case looked at the whole of West Africa. So it's uncertain as to what role uh, other agreements by Kenya will have made, but it, it, it's very clear that what happened in the southern border is a contract, uh, a deal made between Kenya and Tanzania, which is not binding on Somalia. And then finally, I would say uh, no ruling by the ICJ, and as I mentioned, there have been a dozen or so, um, is going to be binding uh, on, on the court itself. So it can uh, ignore what it has ruled in other cases and also what other arbitral tribunals have ruled. So there's an element of uncertainty there. But by and large, there is a, a jurisprudence so that we can make informed predictions as to you know, what might be relevant uh, to, to solve this particular bilateral dispute. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Professor Becker. I'll come back to you, um, Professor Albert Muma. And uh, when Albert speaks, I'd also like us to hear views from Abdul. There was a question by Sharmak Farah. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. The 1924 treaty is irrelevant as both Kenya and Somalia were occupied by the foreign powers who had no consent of the local communities. Um, Professor Muma, can you tell us a little bit what you think is the uh, public international law status of the 1924 treaty? So again, not speculating as between Kenya and Somalia, but pure public international law, what is the status of your view? Oh, thank you, thank you, Arimu. No, it is not relevant at all. The, the, the position in international law is that uh, Treaties uh, dealing with territorial boundaries uh, are treaties which, uh, notwithstanding that they were entered into by colonial powers, would remain uh, binding unless denounced by you know, the country that then became independent. Now, in this particular situation, uh, the, there is no denunciation and uh, Therefore, relevance does not come in. The fact alone that these were colonial powers is, is not at all a basis for arriving at the conclusion that it is irrelevant. The point, though, that I think is, is important to highlight in looking at that treaty is that primarily it dealt with the land boundaries, it dealt also with the territorial sea, and uh, you know, the uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea now provides the, the, the framework and the basis for delimiting this contested uh, EEZ uh, and continental shelf area. So whereas the treaty is uh, relevant, it does not mean that the treaty necessarily determines the issue. And I think that that is a point that came out earlier. But under international law, there is no uh, automatic assumption that the treaty has no relevance. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, Abdul, what is your comment on that? Well, I think that, uh, you know, as Professor Albert mentioned, neither Somalia or Kenya has uh, attacked that 1924 treaty. Uh, so there is a sort of, a, you know, an implicit acceptance of the treaty and the terms that are in that treaty. Um, and, uh, but still, um, you know, as Professor Pecker uh, pointed out, the ICJ has its own ways of looking at things, looking at the documentary evidence that's available. And uh, certainly the 1924 treaty will be looked at by the ICJ. What decision it will base on and what effect it would have, you know, extending from the land uh, terminus point to... Um, to delimit the boundaries is, is really up to speculation at this time. Uh, I'd like to also, you know, point out that, you know, following independence, most of the African countries, um, it, you know, within the OAU made a declaration that they would accept those colonial uh, boundaries. Uh, Somalia has made, uh, you know, at the time there were some boundaries primarily with 
Ethiopia that Somalia never really accepted as being the true boundaries of the Somali Republic. But that issue itself is would be outside uh, this current uh, you know, boundary dispute. So I don't think that the 1924 treaty will have uh, much impact. And as I mentioned before, neither country has made any reservations about it. So I'm assuming that uh, it will be clearly not affecting. All right, and moving on. So thank you, thank you very much for that, um, Abdullah and Professor Muma. Moving away from that, we have an interesting question from Ab Abukar, which I will pitch to you, Robert. He says, or she says, sorry about that, in many maritime disputes, Special circumstances and relevant circumstances are mentioned. Can you please clarify the difference between them and which one Kenya is, um, and which one Kenya would claim um, or use in their favor? Now, I guess that's a bit speculative, but can, can, do you have any comments as to special circumstances versus relevant circumstances? Uh, I, I have to be honest there. I think that's actually a better uh, question for Peter uh, as we work together. Um, Pete, do you actually have a better way of describing that? I, I know the question sounds like it's for different data sources and different relevant portions of the coastal front, but I think that's more a legal question. Peter. Yes, uh, I, I, can, I can address that question uh, as the law of the sea uh, legal specialist. So special circumstances are mentioned in Article 15 of the UNCLOS, which deals with the limitation of the territorial sea. Um, and it mentions the median line failing agreement of the parties. Relevant circumstances are essentially the same concept, um, but that has been developed in the jurisprudence regarding the limitation of the exclusive economic zone and continental shelf. Uh, as I mentioned, in my opening remarks, uh, relevant circumstances uh, might come in to adjust or shift a provisional line. And there, uh, as I mentioned, geography rules. Now, there have been cases, as, as Robert mentioned, where fisheries uh, were a, a relevant circumstance. So dependency on fisheries uh, could come in here. Um, I don't know what the, uh, the Kenyan uh, fisheries um, dependency is. Uh, Somalia has invoked it in its case. We know that before the ICJ, but that was a document from 2015, uh, and that's the only document that we have. Um, I worked on a case between uh, Denmark and Norway at the International Court of Justice when I was a staff lawyer, and uh, that case essentially was decided by um, Greenland's dependency on fisheries. So that might be uh, a factor, but uh, oil and gas blocks typically are um, ignored by international courts and tribunals. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Becker, for that. Now we have five minutes to go to the end of the presentation. I will say a big thank you to the panelists to Robert Van Zipol, to Professor Peter Becker, to Mr. Abdul Abdirahman, and to Professor Albert Muma. You have given very succinct views on an issue that is of great uh, policy, public international law, and political importance. We have participants from diverse countries who have engaged and who have asked questions. So thank you very much for that. And I will give a small clap since we are not in physical presence to clap. Asante Nisana, as we say in, um, in Swahili. And to you, the participants who we have had the great honor of having you on board. Thank you very much for um, coming on. And a big thank you to the Extractives Hub to Victoria Nalula at the Extractives Hub and to Jocelyn Omondi at the Extractives Hub who have made this possible. Um, this presentation is going to be available. Um, special thanks to um, Robert Van Paul for all, all the slides that you have seen. And special thanks again to all of you, uh, my panelists. 
So um, at this juncture, I would say thank you and goodbye. Uh, we have not had any hands raised, but again, participants, if you have any questions, please feel free to email the Extractives Hub who are going to put you in touch with each of the individual panelists to answer any questions that you may have. So thank you very much. Um, excellent presentations, as I can see from the group chat. And this message is going to self-destruct in three, two, one. Thank you. Bye-bye.